The event tonight is a partnership between the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria and the Wheeler Centre. And I know you're all really anxious and uh, keen to welcome and endear her to the stage. And uh, it won't be long before she actually is on stage. But first, to formally welcome you, I invite Eddie Mikalev to the stage. Eddie is the chairperson of the ECCV. He was the member for Springvale and served in the Victorian Parliament from 1983 to 1999, during which time he held numerous responsibilities covering health, industrial relations, work cover and multicultural affairs. Eddie also has a long history of community involvement and is currently also the president of the Beacon Cove Residents Association and a board member of the Inner South Community Health. Please welcome Eddie. Well, thank you, Ross. Uh, as uh, Ross mentioned, uh, my name is Eddie Mikalev and I'm the chairperson of the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria. And it is my great pleasure on behalf of the ECCV to be your host for the evening. And on behalf of the ECCV, I'd like to thank you for joining us here at the Wheeler Centre for this very special evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the original custodians on, on the land upon which we gather tonight, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and uh, who, may, who may be present tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, members of the Lipman family, uh, the ECC board members, uh, Sam Afra, the past chairperson, other distinguished guests, community leaders, ladies and gentlemen. And most port importantly, I'd like to acknowledge our guest lecturer tonight, uh, Indira Naidu, an acclaimed journalist, broadcaster and writer. Indira will surely have us questioning what it is meant to be home and belonging in a globalised world. Tonight we are here to honour the memory of the ECCV founding father, Walter Lippmann, who 40 years ago in 1974 helped to set up the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria. The first organisation of its kind at the time, an umbrella group uniting migrant, ethnic, refugee and multicultural groups led by migrants themselves. But Walter Lippmann's influence uh, upon our organisation and the broader Victorian multicultural community extends much further than that. He was a vigorous campaigner for the rights of community groups at the grassroots level. He advocated for them to be given a fair go on the issues that affected their life. He was one of those instrumental in the development of the policy of multiculturalism as it is in Australia today. Walter Lippmann's founding vision it still continues today at the ECCV. We continue to advocate for a society which is fair for all, which includes lobbying the federal government to leave the Racial Discrimination Act in its current form. The ECCV supports freedom of speech, but not at the expense of permitted offensive insulting, humiliating behaviour based on race and directed at people from culturally, linguistically and spiritually diverse backgrounds. And we can see what's going on in Bendigo at the present time, uh, how we have to be watchful. Although both the ECCV and the Racial Discrimination Act were established 40 years ago, their relevance today cannot be discounted. We will continue to honour Walter Lippmann's work by creating advocacy strategies which bring cultural diversity to the forefront of government thinking on policy and service provision. And I'd like, on a personal note, I'd like to say that I did have the pleasure of working with Walter Lippmann in the establishment of the original Victorian Ethnic Affairs Commission. I took part in some working parties with Walter and that was, to my memory, in 1982. So I have fond memories of Walter at a personal level. Uh, so I'll leave it at that and say thank you for being here tonight.
Thank you, Eddie. Indira Naidu is one of Australia's most popular broadcasters. She's a person with many strings to her bow. If you've been following her career, you'll have seen that uh, she's a prolific broadcaster. And during a 25-year award-winning journalistic career, she's hosted and reported for some of the country's most distinguished news and current affairs programs. Born in South Africa, Indira completed a journalism degree in South Australia and joined the ABC in Adelaide in 1990 as a news cadet. My, what a long way you've come, Indira. She's anchored the ABC News, the 7.30 report, and was the ABC's youngest national news host for the national late edition news in Sydney. She achieved national prominence as host of the ABC's late edition, Nightly News, and as an anchor and reporter for SBS's TV's award-winning late-night news service, The World News Tonight. Indira developed a cult following for her less serious appearances on The McFeast Show, Roy and HG's Club Buggery, Good News Week and The Glass House, and she was also a contestant on the inaugural episode of Celebrity Mastership. Did you all remember that? <laughs> In recent years, Indira's interest has shifted to global environment and sustainability issues. She's been a spokeswoman for Consumer Watchdog Choice, a consumer communications consultant to the United Nations International Trade Center, and was trained by former US Vice President Al Gore to conduct regular presentations about the impacts of climate change. Her first book, The Edible Balcony, an urban farming cookbook published in October 2011, sold over 10,000 copies in the first six months and has been reprinted four times. In 2012, Indira won the Lifestyle Award from InStyle magazine for her food activism work. But tonight, We'll hear from Indira as she explores whether we need to reevaluate our notions of borders and what constitutes a sovereign state. She promises to question the relevance of isolationism in a global marketplace where the economies of neighboring countries are intrinsically linked and communications are instant. I'm sure you're all anxious to hear from Indira. I certainly am. Indira has indicated that she may be prepared to take a couple of questions from the floor if time permits at the end. I mean, that would be a great treat if that was available, but we'll need to wait and see how the timing works out. By the way, for those of you who are up on uh, social media, if you'd like to tweet about the evening tonight, the hashtag is WLML, WLML. On that note, I'd like to welcome Indira Naidu to the stage to deliver the 2014 Walter Lippmann Memorial Lecture, Indira. I'm struggling with a bit of a lurgy, that's why I've got my strepsils and my tissues there. Thank you very much, Ross and um, Eddie, for that uh, wonderful welcome. And I too would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and their elders on whose land we meet tonight. Um, for those of you who do remember my appearance on MasterChef, I didn't do too well. Uh, Matt said my meatballs were spongy, so uh, I was thrown out after the first episode. So <laughs> I won't be pursuing that, that career, I don't think. Now. If um, you had to describe me, the biomass standing before you on the stage tonight, what descriptors would you use? Migrant, refugee, woman, Indian, ethnic, Tamil, Hindu, South African born, Australian, TV newsreader, journalist, writer, author, minor celebrity, Chardonnay, sipping, bleeding heart, lefty, or just plain annoying if you're Andrew Bolt in the audience somewhere. <laughs> Most people will engage with me through one of these stereotypes. None of us seems to be able to avoid labels, being put into boxes that have become a short form way of explaining who we are, how we think, what our hopes and dreams might be. But like all of you here tonight, I am much more than the sum of my parts. No group 
I believe, is more stereotyped in our society today than refugees. The word refugee invokes so much emotion that it's almost impossible to utter the word without immediately polarising your audience. As Australia's treatment of refugees and asylum seekers takes us into our darkest days since the White Australia policy, I've been questioning my values and the values of the country I've called home since my family migrated here 40 years ago. I thought I knew it well, this great southern land of ours, from its eucalypts and bush rock, to its footy ovals and cricket pitches, from its meat pies and kebabs, to its sun, surf and zinc cream. These days, I'm not so sure. The Australia I see reflected in the media, on the floor of our national parliament, on the world stage, looks more foreign to me every day. Tonight, I want to explore some of the issues I believe have brought us to the moral impoverishment of our current refugee and asylum seeker policy and how we might begin navigating our way through the current hysteria to a more humane, compassionate and thoughtful approach. Firstly, I'd like to give you some insights into my perspective. This is me. One of the earliest photos I have of myself, I'm about a year old, and those who know me well would say my mood hasn't really improved much since. <laughs> the arrival of a new baby is usually met with great joy. My parents should have been imagining all sorts of exciting things for my future, but they already knew precisely the way my life would unfold. You see, I was born an Indian girl in apartheid South Africa in 1968. As a fifth generation South African Indian, I was destined to live a life where everything I did would be dictated by my gender and the colour of my skin. As a non-white citizen, the state would determine where I lived, where I went to school, what park benches I could sit on, which beaches I could swim at, who I could marry and where I would be buried. A life of dehumanising discrimination lay ahead for me. But fate intervened and gave me courageous parents who decided to leave South Africa, their family and all they knew, to find a new home for their growing family. In fact, when we left, my parents had to, had to actually smuggle me across the South African border into Zambia because at the time it was illegal for a non-white child to leave South Africa. My mother still talks of her terror as I slept soundly in the back seat covered by blankets as South African bodyguards prodded the bundles on top of me with their rifle butts. My parents' search for a new home took me and my two younger sisters on an extraordinary 16-year adventure across five countries, straddling three continents, 12 homes and six schools. The only thing that remained constant and possibly not accidental, if you know my family, is that every country we migrated to was obsessed with cricket. From South Africa, we went to Zambia, then England, then Tasmania, then back to Africa to Zimbabwe, and finally back to Australia, to South Australia. In our search for a new home, we crossed paths with hundreds of people who were doing the same thing. At airports, at railway stations, at ports, at border checkpoints, people looking for a safe place where they could bring up their families. Most of these people would never have left their homes if they could have built a good, safe life where they were born. We conveniently categorise people into economic migrants, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, but the reality is most people permanently leave their homeland reluctantly. It's only a privileged few who choose when they leave, how they leave, where they go and if they come back. My parents' professional qualifications and English speaking skills gave them more choices than most. In the global labour market of the 1970s, they were in demand, particularly my father's dental skills. When the Whitlam government came to power in 1972, we were living in England and having a pretty tough time of it, like many of the waves of Eastern European and Southeast Asian immigrants. 
My father's dental qualifications gained in India weren't recognised by British authorities and he had to resit the last part of his degree again. Our family was struggling financially and when Gough Whitlam introduced his assistant passage migration scheme, which provided financial assistance to new migrants, my parents didn't hesitate. With my fa father's professional qualifications, our entire family would be resettled in Australia with a new home and a new job. This is how we found ourselves in 1974 in the tiny country town of St Mary's on the rugged east coast of Tasmania. Population, 20,000 kangaroos and 400 people, give or take a few. St Mary's was a sleepy little hamlet. Most of the townsfolk were fourth or fifth generation Tasmanians with a few newly arrived Eastern European immigrants. The indigenous population had been decimated and there was little Asian immigration which until then had been directed towards the major mainland cities. So our arrival in the hamlet was certain to cause a stir. What my parents didn't expect, given the racism they had experienced in South Africa and in England, was the rock star welcome we would receive. To the townsfolk of St Mary's, we were exotic and novel. The town's local socialite, the bus driver's wife, <laughs> arranged an afternoon tea for my mother and my sisters to meet the other families. They were all dressed in their finery, some even wearing hats with flowers. They'd prepared these exotic delicacies we'd never seen before. Lamingtons, <laughs> butterfly cupcakes, fairy bread. We were greeted in a line as if we were the royal family, everyone taking turns to shake our hands. I remember it well, I was six years old. One little girl even asked if she could touch my skin. She'd never seen dark skin before. She was fascinated. Of course, we all had British accents as well, so we must have seemed very odd. We were so welcomed by that town. We were made to feel so included and so special. Children wanted to sit next to us in class. We were invited to weekend barbecues and fishing trips. That sense of specialness bestowed on us by the people of St Mary's has stayed with me ever since. I know my experience contrasts vastly to the mixed or lukewarm welcome many immigrants can receive. Why were the townsfolk of St Mary's so open and accepting? Some would argue that my family was treated differently because we came via the proper channels. We weren't queue jumpers. We weren't illegals. We arrived on a plane with a visa and went through immigration and customs. But of course, the people of St Mary's didn't care how we arrived. We were part of a community making a contribution. And they knew how difficult it was to get a good dentist in a rural town. Sadly, something that's still difficult to do. They showed us compassion and empathy. They wanted to get to know us as individuals, to find the commonalities, to learn about our experiences. After all, this was 1974. Television hadn't yet brought the worst of the world's stereotypes and fears into their lounge rooms. 9-11 was still three decades away. The people of St Mary's didn't have many preconceived ideas about what someone from South Africa was like or what God, an Indian person, would worship. And if they did, they just wanted to get to know us. Personal contact will temper most of the prejudices we will fall prey to. If you want to kill compassion and demonise difference, segregate people. It's what apartheid South Africa did so effectively. It's what Australia is doing now by putting asylum seekers, including children, behind razor wire thousands of miles offshore, removed from the Australian community. <clears throat> My family soon got a dose of life away from the protection and privilege of Australia. When eight years after we arrived in Tasmania, my parents decided to move back to Africa, to Zimbabwe, in the early 1980s. Yes, as well as being courageous, my parents are a little nutty. They wanted to be closer to their family in South Africa. They thought their professional skills would come in handy in a fledgling nation. And um, they also wanted to give us, their children, a taste of Africa. 
all admirable goals. But when we arrived in the central town of Gweru in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe was still healing from a vicious civil war. I was 13 years old. We got a front row seat of war, conflict, racial upheaval. Some of it played out in our schoolyard. It very quickly became apparent that Prime Minister Robert Mugabe was going to be no Nelson Mandela. He began an ethnic cleansing campaign against the minority Indebele people, took control of the media and the army, and set up one of the most bloodthirsty regimes Australia has ever seen, uh, Africa has ever seen. As food and petrol shortages swept the country, there was a mad scramble to leave. Some of our school friends and their families fled to South Africa and Botswana. A lucky few made it to Great Britain. And our family were able to escape back to paradise because we possessed a little piece of paper, an Australian passport. I'd never understood the preciousness of my citizenship and nationality more so than on that day as a 16-year-old when we boarded a plane back to Australia via South Africa. I saw why some people risk everything to one day be cloaked under its protection. Given my experiences and my background, it wasn't surprising that I would build a career in journalism. I also had a big mouth. What did surprise me were the sorts of students I met in my journalism course. They were mostly from Anglo, English-speaking, middle-class, private school backgrounds. I was the only non-white student in my graduation year of 33 students. And really, for the rest of my career in broadcast journalism in Australia, that was to be the statistical mix I would encounter. Even when I moved to SBS, our multicultural network, to anchor the late news in the late 1990s, I was the only non-European person on my late news team. While the mix has changed slightly in the past 20 years, Australia's media is still dominated by journalists from Anglo-English speaking backgrounds. This cultural imbalance has been one of the reasons I believe we get a skewed media view of the refugee debate in Australia. It's much easier to frame the debate as us and them when you don't look much like them. Many people in the mainstream media simply can't relate to refugees and lack the cultural awareness to empathise with their experiences. Sometimes, rather than connecting you, seeing the world only through a camera lens can put an enormous gulf between you and your subject. Of course, there are media outlets, mainly at the ABC and SBS, and a few press outlets, that give refugee issues balance and deeper analysis. Often, they do so at their peril. Critical assessments of government policy can lead to threats of funding cuts, as we're witnessing at the moment, or unrelenting campaigns, public pillory, and accusations of left-wing bias from conservative media outlets. Cuts to public broadcasting have also limited the time and resources journalists can spend investigating refugee and asylum seeker issues. The journalists and editors who continue to pursue this story are courageous and to be applauded. But as Australia's traditional media industry contracts and more news services are acts, many journalists are forced to find work elsewhere. The ranks of public relations firms and government spin doctors inevitably swell. Some are then employed to pump out more anti-refugee sentiment. It was revealed last year that the previous Gillard government engaged 72 media advisers and communication staff in the immigration and health departments alone. The total staff employed in public affairs was five times the number of journalists and staff employed in the entire Canberra Press Gallery. And the spin doctors are achieving their goal. The dehumanisation of refugees is complete when a young vulnerable soul under our protection is killed in one of our facilities and the national outrage is barely audible. Four months after Reza Barati's death on Manus Island, an investigation and an ongoing Senate inquiry later, and the Australian public still doesn't know the details of who killed Reza and how it happened. We took away Reza's hope and then we took away his future. Can there be a greater stain on our national soul? 
Why are those fleeing their homes now locked up indefinitely like criminals with no charge in prisons we euphemistically call detention centres? Detention is a short-term punishment you give naughty children who haven't done their homework. Detention is one of the weasel words we have corrupted to hide our inhumanity. From the most recent figures from the Australian Human Rights Commission, there are currently 5,867 people locked away in Australia's 21 immigration detention facilities. 1,006 of them are children. 3,391 people are a little better off in community detention and 1,631 of these are also children. 100 and 19 people have been in detention for over two years. Two years of traumatic incarceration to, the, to add to the untold horrors they have fled. And what our political leaders and shock jokes, jocks won't tell you is that 90% of asylum seekers who arrive by boat are found to be refugees. So, we've spent almost $3 billion this financial year on temporary protection visas, mandatory detention, migration excision zones, the offshore processing arrangements in Nauru and Papua New Guinea to persecute vulnerable people who in the end are found to be mostly genuine refugees. And on top of this, it was revealed last week that the Immigration Department is paying asylum seekers $10,000 each to voluntarily return to their tormentors and, bull and the bullets they have fled. And all of this is held up as sound economic management. Once a human rights defender, Australia is now being condemned internationally as a pariah. The United Nations Human Rights Committee has repeatedly found Australia to be in breach of its obligations under Article 9, Section 1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Our problem is not refugees. Our problem is the fear industry that has been allowed to grow and profit from exploiting refugees. This industry includes the politicians who use refugee bashing as an easy way to get re-elected. It includes the well-paid newspaper columnists with little compassion or cleverness to talk about the complexities of the issue. It includes the media shock jocks who use their loud megaphones to bully the moderate voices and incite the extreme ones. And it includes, sadly, an inattentive public who would prefer to talk about real estate, renovations and recipes. Despite what we are constantly told, our refugee numbers are small. In 2012, a total of 17,202 asylum seekers on 278 boats arrived in Australia. By mid last year, 14,000 people had made it to our shores. While significant, the reality is that Australia still receives less than 2% of the 50 million people fleeing persecution and conflict and war across the world. Less than 2%. Let me put this into context. Lebanon, for instance, has taken in almost 1 million refugees, mainly from the Syrian civil war. It only has a population of 4.5 million. So these refugee numbers pose a grave threat to its stability, but it still keeps its borders open. While our refugee intake is tiny in comparison, my concern is with the growing challenges climate change will place on our fragile world, Australia will face in the near future an influx from climate change refugees in our region. And unless we can begin formulating a sensible policy based on ethics about refugees and about climate change, we will encounter a very real human humanitarian crisis we will be ill-equipped to deal with. Just in the past year, typhoons and cyclones have hit low-lying parts of the Philippines, India and Bangladesh, leaving millions homeless. And we already know how vulnerable many of our Pacific neighbours are to rising sea levels. Some communities in the Pacific and Southeast Asia will be forced to relocate to safe regions and Australia will be an obvious destination. Interestingly, 
under the wording of the UN's pre-climate change 1951 Convention on the Rights of Refugees, people fleeing natural disasters are currently not classified as refugees. No doubt this definition will need to be revisited. Australia is one of the most climate change at risk developed nations on the planet. Throwing more money at border patrols or border protection will not save us from a changing climate. Border protection will not stop climate change. Borders aren't real. They're not a force of nature like gravity. They are man-made. They are artificial constructs that can be redrawn, absorbed, extended or extinguished in a nanosecond by a red pen in a distant office or by a tank in a battlefield. It's happening right now in the Ukraine as I speak. While we obsess with turning back the boats, the real menace to our way of life has already arrived in our atmosphere, unchecked, moving freely, and it gets harder to turn back every day we keep ignoring it. Let's concentrate our efforts on turning back climate change. It is time we closed our offshore processing centres in Nauru and Menace Island. It is time we ended mandatory detention. It is inhumane and expensive policy that does no good any, does no one any good. It is a policy that breaches Australia's international obligations and persecutes the very people we have committed ourselves to protecting. We're diminished as a nation every day we allow it to continue. Detention in these facilities is unlimited and arbitrary, and those detained are denied legal aid and avenues to challenge their detention in a court of law. The Australian Human Rights Commission has found that our detention facilities inflict serious psychological harm on detainees that amounted to cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. The Commission recommended that a person should be detained only if they are individually assessed as posing an unacceptable risk to the Australian community, and if that risk could not be met in a less restrictive way. Asylum seekers should be permitted to reside in the community while their immigration status is resolved. This can be achieved through the use of community detention or with bridging visas. This is happening at the moment for some detainees and is working very well. They should also have a right to pursue paid work which will give them some dignity. Community detention and bridging visas are both alternatives that allow for the wider community to be protected from, un from identified risks while ensuring at the same time that people are treated humanely in line with internationally accepted human rights standards. Australia needs to reset its moral compass. We know there are no cues for these people to jump. We know there is no such person as an illegal. Everyone has the legal right to seek asylum. If we turn back the boats at our borders, their occupants could possibly die somewhere else due to our intervention. They may not die within our borders, but is this still not something we should feel a responsibility for? Of course we should. It is heartless to feel otherwise. We should refocus our resources on resolving the issues which force refugees to flee their homes and undertake risky journeys in the first place. In places like Afghanistan and Iraq, where we contributed to the war, we have a duty to contribute to the peace. We should use our influence with countries such as Sri Lanka to curb its human rights abuses, not make excuses for them. We must redouble our efforts to work more closely with Indonesia and Malaysia and the UNHCR in the processing and resettlement of refugees. Australia needs to resume its moral leadership in the region rather than bullying poor nations such as Cambodia and Papua New Guinea into doing our dirty work for us. The Dalai Lama showed his great insight when he said that compassion is the radicalism of our times. To show compassion publicly on this issue takes great courage. It is to step outside the mainstream. It is to swim against the tide. We are attacked and condemned for showing kindness, even though that is something we teach our children to display in the playground. 
All too often, we see the chilling coldness in the eyes of a politician explaining on the news why some people are more equal than others. Our fear of boat arrivals is nothing new. In fact, it can be argued that since the first boat people came here on the first fleet, boat arrivals have occupied a paranoia in our national psyche that few other fears have. I've often wondered why, when the perceived threat has never matched the reality. When those who arrive by plane and overstay their visas far exceed boat arrivals in numbers. Recently, a philosopher at Deakin University, Patrick Stokes, offered a theory that I do find compelling. He argues that boat arrivals remind us that we haven't earned what we have. Our prosperity rests on happy accident rather than cosmic justice. Just as we took this land illegally from the first Australians, we subconsciously fear that someone will come along and take it from us. John Howard's now infamous declaration, we will decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come, comes from a frightened place of deep insecurity. The emphasis is on sovereignty, not on mercy. If I don't defend my patch, someone will take it away. While the true reality is that while we fight over borders and sovereignty and who we let in and who we don't, climate change is stealing our future away from us inch by inch. I'm very blessed and very proud to be an Australian, but I'm also a global citizen. I have an allegiance to this planet as well. When we talk only about our world in terms of borders and countries and nationalities and cultures and religions, all we're doing is creating damaging divisions when we should be strengthening our common humanity. People are often ask me where I'm from or where I consider home to be, given my nomadic childhood. Whoops. <laughs> this is my home. This is our home. Let's start a new conversation. Thank you. Why do you think, uh, in your experience, the mainstream media isn't as representative as our society? In other words, why is it so white Anglo? Uh, look, I think mainly, you know, for good or bad, Australia still largely is a country and, and its institutions are based on um, Christian, British, Westminster and English speaking, um, you know, sort of values and traditions. So. I think it is quite difficult when you come from cultures that um, haven't had an experience of that. Um, it's one thing to, you know, accept it and, em and embrace it. But then I think to become a, um, a journalist or a media commentator requires um, a, a different lef level of, in, you know, engagement and connection with a lot of those values. And so, um, you know, Australia is really difficult. Even people who have uh, non-Australian English accents struggle on Australian television and radio. If you have a Canadian accent or if you have a British accent or New Zealander accent, Australians want to hear Australian accents. They want to see what they think an Australian looks like. And I think still, unfortunately, it is that idea of home and away. It is that blue-eyed, blonde-haired kid on the beach. And I think that that still hasn't hugely changed you know, in, in my era, really. And I think that because of that, um, that then t tends to, you know, give people the confidence, oh, I can move into working in the, on television because I've seen those sorts of people um, present the news or be actors on those television shows. So I think that, you know, it, it becomes a vicious cycle. If you don't see those faces in your media, then you don't think that you can be one of those faces. So, um, you know, there's lots of things that are, and positive things like um, that have been done by the ECCV where um, we're trying to connect people from different cultures and different nationalities into traditional media so that they can engage with it and, and see it as a, a potential career path rather than looking at, you know, a lot of ethnic families tend to encourage their kids to go into 
accounting and dentistry, law and medicine, um, rather than the arts and communication. So maybe that's something that also needs to change to sort of change that mix of people. Um, thanks very much for that, uh, Indira. Um, can I just uh, ask for your thoughts on um, human rights and climate change and how our current human rights problems uh, limit our ability to influence that in other countries? Uh, it, it sort of always frustrates me when I hear about people saying, you know, and our leaders and politicians saying Australia shouldn't be a leader in climate change. We should see what everyone else does and then follow their lead. I, we've, never, we've never done that before. You know, we've been a leader in so many areas of human rights and women votes and, and, and a whole lot of other things. I, I think that, um, you know, being a wealthy, um, developed country, it's it's our responsibility and obligation to take leadership in lots of areas, including in, in the area of climate change, particularly just putting aside everything else, that we are going to be so affected. I mean, Australians know it in their hearts when they see what's happening to our, our climate. And there can be arguments of it's just a weather blip or a whatever, but the reality is the climate change is happening and we're experiencing it in its severity from floods and bushfires and, and, and unusually high temperatures and cold temperatures and a whole lot of weird things that are happening. So um, just for our own survival, you know, we, sh we should take this seriously and see the effect that it's going to have on our own community, on the people that potentially are going to come here because they're fleeing some of the worst examples of climate change in, in our region. Um, you know, we just can't keep on you know, this idea of just turning everything back and building fences and walls and uh, it's not the way that we're going to really cope with this. It's going to get to such a stage where um, we, we're just not going to be able to financially and, and people power manage it all. You know, we have to have some sort of ethical program that really accepts climate change happening, accepts that there are lots of positive, you know, green and... Um, sustainable initiatives that we can benefit from that people are developing in Australia and taking overseas because our governments aren't supporting them. So, you know, I, I see it as an opportunity rather than, you know, this, this sort of scary thing, you know, it's an opportunity for us to change the way we, we live and live in a more sustainable way. But, you know, the longer we leave it, the worse it's going to get, the bigger the, the um, challenges are going to be for us, you know, every, every day that we delay it means that it's going to be more expensive and, and more difficult for, you know, the next generations coming. So, yeah, we need to do it now. What is your view on Australia's recurring theme of requiring somebody uh, to be vilified, excluded and named as unacceptable, undesirable, etc.? Thank you. Well, I, I think I slightly alluded to it in my speech by saying, I mean, I've often thought about it, and I don't, I don't know if it's a satisfactory explanation, but I think until, again, we address uh, how this land was taken from the first Australians and, you know, address that wound that even if we don't acknowledge just hangs there all the time and affects every new wave of of, of arrival that comes to Australia, I, I don't really think that we can move forward. I think we have to address um, that injustice, um, the, the um, illegality of that dispossession, and I think we may see a change once that's happened. I mean, I, I was amazed, you know, during the Rudd, um, you know, um, ap apology, there was this amazing catharsis in the community, even people who didn't really think that it was something that we should have done. Everyone still felt that it was, you know, a sort of, you know, some, uh, you know, that this needed to be done and, and, and felt a, a, a relief from it. And it went some way, obviously, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done. So I would, I would sort of hesitate to sort of argue that that you know, that first injustice needs to be corrected before you can correct all the other injustices that have flowed from that. We were, we were going to allow three questions, but given Arnold, Arnold our last year's lecturer, wants to uh, ask a question, we'll grant him that privilege, okay? okay. Yeah. 
Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm looking at that, uh, the way you ended uh, with the, the global perspective, and there's a, there's a saying, think uh, uh, globally but act locally. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you, um, last week during Refugee Week, I saw a different Australia, and where I saw it was at the local level, by going to places like Dandenong, the city of Moreland, the city of Yarra, where I was invited to take part in Refugee Week, and I was blown away, especially in Dandenong. Mm. I mean, Dandenong is a revolution, and it's happening at the local level, and there, I think, is where we're getting the sort of leadership that's uh, we're not getting at the uh, the Commonwealth level, at the federal level. So I just wanted to ask you, you know, to reflect upon that, uh, you know, think globally, act locally, and do you see this other Australia too? It's as if there's something happening uh, that uh, we can see as a model for mm. the future, and it's happening in all kinds of local communities. Yeah, great, great question, Arnold. Um, one of, one of the things that I re I've really enjoyed from stepping away from mainstream media, but mostly strip, st stepping away from the physical constraints of mainstream media. You know, most mainstream media um, exists in certain parts of cities and certain well-to-do parts of cities. And I used to spend a lot of my time in studios, even though I was talking about things happening in other parts of the world. I didn't really know. You know, I didn't really ever meet real people you know, uh, but I was expected to report and, and reflect what real people were doing and what real people were thinking. And I do spend a lot more time, I think, with real people. So due to my um, environment and, and um, sustainability work, one or two times a week, I'm with school groups, retirement groups, different migrant and, and ethnic groups around the country. And it's been such an education for me. I mean, it's completely changed my view of what's really going on in Australia and where it's at. And, and I'm a big believer that, you know, the big problem we've got, we've got lots of grassroot activity going on. You know, people are passionate at a grassroot level about everything that we've talked about tonight. But it's not going through the system into our political parties, into our political leadership. And, and I think that that is a real problem, that we look at, we've got a political ruling class in this country at the moment that's not connected to the voters at all. And um, we have to connect them. You know, we have to start doing things to connect them. And, and the, the first thing is, is to get people activated, to get them annoyed enough that they will go, you know, I've loved seeing people protest on the streets again. Like, I haven't seen that for decades, you know. Um, just to, to, you know, to snap them out of just watching a reality television show in the evening and, and that being, you know, what they sort of do in their spare time, um, being more engaged in the political process and, and actually making sure that it reflects, you know, who they are. Look, most Australians, for instance, want, you know, um, marriage equality laws in Australia but none of our parties do. I mean, w what's happening with so many of these sort of economic and social reforms that the community say that they want, that it's not happening at a, at a parliamentary level. So I think the real challenge is to get the people who are already active at a grassroots level to, you know, really occupy that, that sort of political leadership space and, and sort of move into it. And, and what we're seeing with, it, sadly, the ICAC Corruption Commission in New South Wales is that we're going to get some changes in our political structures that open it up, that um, make it fairer, that, you know, stop a lot of the, the vote rigging and the, all that sort of stuff that's been going on, that allows real community leaders to move into you know, um, representative seats and things. And I think, you know, I think I'm, I'm very optimistic, actually, about the next phase that we're going through. Um, I think what we've seen in sort of state and federal politics in Australia, we've all been quite appalled by it in the last five or six years. And I don't think we want a, that to keep on carrying on. I think we're looking for leadership that is truly representative of, of who we are and where we are. And I think Australians are going to start coming out of this, you know, um, you know, it, things have been very good for us for a very long time. Economically, we've been very comfortable. Um, most of us, you know, eat and, and live well. Um, and I think we've started to sort of be numbed into that that's just going to carry on forever. 
Um, and I think that that's starting to now, you know, um, especially I've seen that with the reaction to this, this recent federal budget. People are starting to realise actually things can quite change if we don't stand up and say that we don't want them to change. So, um, you know, I've, I've, I'm very excited to, when I look at those grassroots movements. Um, and I don't think it's going to be very long before we're going to see, you know, Sudanese refugees, representatives moving into federal parliament and all those sorts of things. I mean, that's what I'm looking forward to, that our parliament truly represents the people. Thanks, Indira. Look, I think that was a positive note to finish on, and uh, thank you for the question, Arnold. I think uh, uh, local government areas like Ballarat, Maribyrnong, uh, Brimbank are all we're doing the same as Dandenong, so look, I think there is a grassroots uh, revolution coming and I think uh, there are some good signs there. So once again, put your hand together for India. Thank you.